Hey y'all, I'm Dan Hamilton, the host of the Next Gen Warrior Show, broadcasting here from Studio 8 at the Stephen F. Austin building in downtown Austin. As always, the Next Gen Warrior Show is brought to you by Chairman George P. Bush. Today I have the great honor and opportunity to sit down with the boss himself. Chairman, thank you for being here today. You got it. Um, so let me ask you this. Uh, for, for folks who are listening in the audience or watching at home, talk to us about how you uh, became chairman of the Veterans Land Board, maybe starting with your time in college uh, and the experiences that you had, uh, not only in the Naval Reserves, but uh, in the private sector as well. Well, when I was in college, um, I took on uh, causes greater than self and um, drew a lot of interest in uh, teaching. And so my first job out of college was teaching in a high school close to where Hurricane Andrew uh, damaged uh, a part of South Florida. Mm. Uh, from there, hopped on my uncle's presidential campaign in 2000, uh, applied for law school here in Austin, University of Texas, met my beautiful wife uh, at that time, which is uh, an important uh, part of anybody's pathway. Uh, after that, uh, clerked for a federal judge, practiced law, started a business, had two kids, and in 2014 threw my hat in the ring for public service. And um, I love the mission of the land office, but most importantly, the Veterans Land Board and what we do for our 1.7 million veterans here in the state. And how long have you been in office for then? Coming up on uh, six years. Um, I got sworn in in 2015 and got reelected in 2018. And so uh, we just wrapped up our legislative session in 2019. And in 2020, we'll be traveling the state and talking about issues like energy, mm -hmm. uh, which the land office is intimately involved with, but of course, uh, spreading the message far and wide for our military veterans as well. So you had uh, extensive experience in, uh, in the public sector, obviously after six years uh, in your second term as land commissioner and chairman of the Veterans Land Board. You've also been in the private sector, studied law, been a lawyer, uh, uh, started businesses. What I'm interested to know is, is for veterans who are out there and you have had such a, a wide array of experience across different industries, is there uh, maybe a soft skill, a characteristic um, or just kind of a mindset that you think would uh, be important for veterans to, to learn and understand to be successful after the military? Well, this is where I think members of the military have a unique advantage over civilians. And to take a step back for a second, it's hard to, to recognize the fact that only 1% of our population have worn a uniform at, at one point. But based upon the training that you have, active duty, reserve duty, uh, it doesn't matter, you've been taught a, a lesson of leadership that no other civilian has exposure to. And so here, this being the week of Kobe Bryant's untimely passing, I think about the amazing work ethic that he brought every day as an LA Laker. And to his I'm, craft. I'm not, a, I'm not a Laker fan by any means, uh, <laughs> but the work ethic that he brought and his uh, unwillingness to lose was something that distinguished him from a very talented group of players. And so. When I look at the corporate world and I look at s stories of success of military members, um, whether they're startup founders or uh, climbing the corporate ladder of the largest company in the world, what I think about is that unwillingness to lose. Yeah. And um, that's the type of drive and work ethic that members of the military bring. So I'm interested to know what has been the most rewarding part of being uh, chairman of the Veterans Land Board. Well, it's that we, we touch the, the hearts and the homes of military veterans here in the state. I love the fact that we are number two only behind California, even though we have a full 20 million people less than California. Um, and we are probably in the next few years will surpass California's veteran population. Um, we have 1.7 million veterans here in this state. And Texans are starting to recognize that military veterans are honored here better than any other state in the country. So as the principal partner with the federal VA and as the broker with our military veteran community working with the legislature and being a part of that story mm -hmm. is uh, an absolute call to service. So there's, there's obviously a lot of challenges that we face within the veteran yep. community in terms of mm -hmm. suicide and, and workforce transition issues. But in terms of what Texas does for her veterans, it's far better than any other state. Absolutely. So I'm interested to know, is there a, a leadership style or is there a characteristic that you have tried to emulate um, as, as commissioner of the land office, something that you either routinely come back to or uh, maybe a book you read or somebody that you look up to to continue to provide you guidance uh, as a leader? 
Well, a little known fact about my military background is that when I was deployed to Afghanistan, I supported, from an intelligence standpoint, mm -hmm. the Special Operations Command, and I had a chance to uh, work under Admiral McRaven. His predecessor was General Stanley McChrystal yeah. at Bagram, and he wrote an incredible uh, book called Team of Teams. And uh, members of our executive team here at the land office had a chance to personally receive clinics from him in terms of his approach. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they were able to break down silos within the Special Operations Command and better share information allowed us to better target the, the warfighter um, downrange in Iraq and Afghanistan. And his track record speaks for itself. And so that's the style of leadership that we bring to bear at the land office, whether it was in response to Hurricane Harvey or taking on the, the great energy challenges of today. Uh, that's the t style of leadership that I've been promoting here in the land office. So maybe for a CEO or um, an executive of, of a private business or elsewhere in government, can you explain to them a little bit more about the team of teams concept and how maybe they can incorporate it uh, either into their businesses or um, just a, a little bit more about the actual approach that you took within the agency to emulate that? So there are numerous examples in the private sector, and I won't name individual companies for okay. you, Daniel, but, uh, <laughs> but there's examples in which one aspect of the organization doesn't communicate with the other aspect, and regretfully you find out about these crises uh, in the news. Right. And so as a CEO or executive, if you just allocate more time to promoting cross-pollinization of committees and structures within a company, but also promoting information sharing and, sh and saying that nobody owns information, nobody owns a certain aspect of the organization um, that you have to share, that we're all part of one team. Yeah. Um, and uh, that helps to, and if you allocated more time to doing that, that yeah. you would actually avoid the catastrophic situations that you see a lot of companies have, have to backpedal on. Um, and so in the military, what General Stanley McChrystal did w in response to IEDs that were utilized mm -hmm in the green zone and all aspects of, I of Iraq was that he um, emphasized with his intelligence community that every single aspect of the organization, uh, whether you were a Green Beret, whether you were a Navy SEAL, uh, any kind of special operator, you needed to know as much as the other team did. Mm. Um, and that, th that there were no secrets. And that's hard to say, especially in the intelligence community where you're trained for years to, to keep secrets. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, and it's carry a out one mission, right? As opposed to he, the concept, you know, you're talking about is really trying to make sure that regardless of what section you might be in or what unit you might be in, you're still uh, focusing on the overarching goal as opposed to just what your section is focused on. Absolutely, and leadership has to reward folks for doing exactly that. Um, and, and you know, if if you're in an organization, of course you want to shine in front of the boss. Mm -hmm. um, but the boss needs to communicate to uh, the rank and file that you're going to be celebrated if the overall team is succeeding. Absolutely. So, um, it's it's a great. I would highly recommend it if you have time to check out Team of Teams. Um, it focuses on the military aspect of how you can do that, but also how it helps um, civilian CEOs as well. Yeah. Um, you know, in American society, we are seeing uh, just so many different uh, conversations, ongoing conversations and ongoing struggles, especially within the, uh, the veteran community uh, regarding anxiety or depression and mental health. I'm actually interested to know um, not just the struggles, but what you do to stay mentally healthy, uh, what you stay uh, or how you stay mentally equipped uh, to prepare for some of the challenges that you face in this job so that maybe from your example, veterans can start applying those almost as preventative med uh, medicine for um, their transition out of service. Well, for me, uh, a big stress reliever is fitness. Mm -hmm. I am a, a fitness nut. Uh, right now, I, I love new fitness challenges. Right now, I'm trying to run my fastest time for the Capital 10K here in Austin. Yeah. Um, I'm a big CrossFitter. I love cross training. I've been uh, trying kickboxing. That for sure is a stress reliever. Yeah. Maybe the best. Hitting the uh, bag, huh? Hitting the bag, the yeah. heavy bag. Um, but I, I would highly recommend that. Fitness is uh, the best way to relieve stress and um, helps to maintain balance and also decompresses all the clutter that you might have uh, up there. Another stress reliever um, has been withdrawing from my handheld. Mm. Um, we are now absolutely addicted. It's a difficult thing to do. It, it, is, it is difficult, but there are apps that help you with that or settings on your, uh, on, on your iPhone as well as on your Samsung Galaxy 
to basically train you to put the screen down. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking of reading, what I do yeah. is, is put the screen down at, at 9 p.m. every night. It doesn't matter if What's there's an emergency. On? Um, and, and I'm reading a book, and that's a really good way to decompress and get better better uh, rest. Is that something you think from a leadership position is almost more difficult because uh, if you're a rank and file person, you may have a, a one direct boss, but as a senior management or somebody who's a leader in a company, you're responsible for so many different sections and so many different divisions. Uh, how are you able to stay disciplined to be able to put your phone down and say, hey, I'm just going to give this a rest. It can, it can wait till tomorrow. Is that, has that been difficult for you or has it gotten easier over time? Well, I think there's exceptions to the rule. So clearly after Hurricane Harvey, the storms, uh, the state's most devastating storm uh, ever, mm -hmm. uh, there was an exception to that rule, especially in the nights leading up to our, our charge from the yeah. governor uh, of Texas to lead the housing recovery effort. But for the most part, when it's a non-crisis situation, at 9 p.m., I am offline. But going back to General Stanley McChrystal, Team of Teams, what he emphasizes as well is empowering um, folks within your organization. So whether it's Mark Havens, our chief clerk here, number deputy two. land commissioner, my number two, or the deputy directors that run coastal uh, oil spill response, which work 24-7, they are empowered to make the decision on my behalf in the event of a crisis situation. And we will work to uh, make decisions after the fact. Yeah. Um, but there are certain situations and there are exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, it's important to empower your your leadership as well. Yeah, uh, so I'm actually interested to know too, after, after being in uh, crisis management situations, learning from those uh, experiences, seeing how your staff dealt with them, what would you tell yourself six years ago uh, when you were running for this position? You know, what advice would, would you give yourself? Um, you know, I would take more time uh, with family. I would uh, prioritize what's essential in life, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's family and friends. Um, sometimes we do get lost in um, the politics of today, especially uh, in this business. Yeah. Um, but there are more important things, and that's family and friends. But um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what we've done here. Uh, when you think about our response after Hurricane Harvey or making sure the Alamo is around for future generations or maintaining the portfolio that we do. And um, I'm excited about what 2020 is gonna bring for the agency as well. Awesome. So I'm interested to know too, for, for veterans struggling with transition, we've kind of outlined some ways, uh, some preventative uh, measures that you can take, whether you know it's putting down your handhelds, kind of turning off from the world, uh, spending some time with, with family and friends. For uh, a veteran or maybe someone uh, who has not served, you know, if they're struggling with these sort of mental health issues that plague uh, a large portion of American society today, what would be uh, your message to them during uh, maybe some of these struggles that they're facing? I would recommend that it's okay to say if you have a problem. You know, many of us in the military uh, sometimes are dismissive about having uh, having issues. There are an abundance of resources, not only on base but off base, uh, to help every service member, uh, whether they've been in for over 20 years or um, you know reservist. And we can't lose sight of that. I think also the rest of us, mainly civilians, mm -hmm. need to uh, raise a red flag and be. Uh, a battle buddy, as we say in the military, to our our veterans that are dealing with transition. Encourage issues. them to find that help and encourage come alongside them and say, "Hey, th there's no uh, there's no harm, there's no weakness in this. This is essentially what you need to go do to take care of yourself." I exactly, and and know that you know people like us at the land office we're fighting for veterans courts here in Texas, so that if you do run into legal issues, that your issue is going to be adjudicated by fellow military veterans, not by the traditional civilian model, um, but that there are a ton of resources out there to just talk through some of these issues, um, all kinds of therapy available, which we even offer at our nine homes that we manage mm -hmm. throughout the state of Texas. And like I said at the outset, Texas serves her, better, uh, her veterans better than any other state. So as a military veteran that's dealing with mental health issues or transitional issues, this is the place to, to to find that battle buddy, to find that resource, and, and to overcome that challenge. So for a, an American or uh, someone here in Texas who, who might be in high school and they are considering joining the military, and maybe even uh, after, after college and they're looking to go from the, the ROTC program and get a commission, what was your experience in the Naval Reserves like 
and could you maybe provide some insight into your time that may help them prepare for a career in the reserves? Uh, what I would recommend to really anybody is to get started early and often in the military. I got my commission at the age of 30, mm. um, and really it was a response to 9-11, which was our, our nation's uh, most devastating event, really since Pearl Harbor. Absolutely. So my situation is different than I think most uh, members of the military. Um, but again, the leadership training that one obtains through the military is unmatched uh, in the civilian world. So um, my recommendation is to, is to uh, network um, yeah. and get to know people that have served in the military. They'd be more than happy uh, to, to share some of the insides in terms of everything from boot camp to getting that commission. Um, JROTC is a great pipeline as well. Um, many Texas universities offer that on campus. Um, but th what I loved about being a reservist in terms of my personal experience was that I was a citizen soldier. Um, I kept a job and I yeah. kept my profession and uh, I was married at the time, but on the weekends I was able to throw on that uniform and be a, be a, a sailor, which I absolutely enjoyed and uh, did for over 10 years, including my you know close to a year of active duty. Uh, I had a chance to see all parts of the world. I got to meet people from all backgrounds and all walks of life and all parts of our country and um, I consider it the most important experience that I've ever had yeah. um, in terms of my background. So um, I highly recommend it to anybody. It, it forces you to challenge yourself in a way that you never thought that you could achieve. And uh, I'm eternally grateful for that opportunity. How about uh, your time after, after coming back from Afghanistan? You know, one of the things that I think veterans struggle with, uh, regardless if it's, it's not the wounds of war or, or PTSD, but it's actually kind of a cultural shock. You know, uh, when you're in the intelligence community and you're and you're working to uh, keep men and women safe on the front lines, and then you come back, just the priorities, the uh, the battle rhythm, as we used to say, is much different in the states uh, than what you're uh, you know feeling in the briefing room or. Uh, when you're talking with commanding officers trying to make sure that uh, an attack or a plan or uh, uh, Marines or uh, soldiers in the defense are well prepared and have the information that they want. Uh, much different uh, setting and surrounding than coming back and jumping back into the private sector. Uh, how were you able to process and, and what did you do uh, once you returned to try to make sure that you could uh, continue to, to work and pick up kind of almost where you left off after, after you deployed? Well, to be honest with you, and, and a lot of folks that deal with mental health issues in the military veteran community say the same thing, that you feel deflated when you come back to our, our great country because of the great privileges and opportunities yeah. we have. Mm -hmm. And to be endowed with so much responsibility downrange, regardless of your rank, regardless of your branch, and then to come back and suddenly, you know, what's next? You've lost that uh, responsibility. Um, but to be honest with you, as a reservist, when I came back from my active duty, uh, I got a little bit of dwell time, but mm -hmm. when I came back to my unit, uh, my unit was focused on CENTCOM, so it was still evaluating the risks and challenges in the Middle East mm -hmm. that I had a chance to mentor new soldier sailors, oh, airmen. Yeah. And, I, and I just uh, not only appreciated that opportunity, but as a junior officer, had a chance to really decompress myself and relieve a lot of my anxiety from having a lower uh, yeah. set of responsibilities yeah. Yeah. than I had. But to, to help train the next enlisted or junior officer that was going to go downrange uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan was a great opportunity and, and again, another um, uh, opportunity to be, to be a leader. And that's the beautiful thing about the military is that we always look out for each other. Um, we always have one mission, one plan in which we attack. Um, but as a reservist, it gave me a chance to roll back to my old unit, yeah. help train the next generation, and um, and uh, transition in a good, healthy way. Now, I think that's a that's an excellent point that you pick up because something that I think uh, you were able to identify is that you couldn't stop serving. Even if you left the war zone, you still found a way to pour into. Uh, you know the arm, the folks in the armed forces who are coming after you, and that's such a critical, I think, uh, maybe a critical component that veterans miss after they leave service is they don't have that uh, ability, maybe, to feel like they're serving somebody in a certain way. But your message is, you know, find some way to serve, regardless if it's in the military or if it's afterwards, because it does give you uh, that sense of feeling like you're a part of something that's bigger than yourself, even if it's not being in a war zone. It's, it's extremely important. Totally. Yeah, it, it can take the form of uh, nonprofits or organizations. I mean, 
Speaking of Harvey, the greatest um, reassurance that we had at the land office was seeing Team Rubicon out on the front lines. Now, yep. Team Rubicon is composed, it was started by Jake Wood, who's a former military veteran, and he created this organization basically composed of military veterans that still cared about their country. And, and, and your country needs you more uh, in, in, in response to a natural disaster than virtually anything else, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. And so when Hurricane Harvey occurred, Team Rubicon was out on the in the field, mucking and gutting homes, and it was all military veterans. And I can't tell you, Daniel, and you helped me mm -hmm. rebuild and muck and gut a lot of these homes yeah. as well, uh, up and down the Texas Gulf Coast, but it was military veterans that were doing it. And so um, I, I think you're absolutely right that you don't necessarily have to stay, like I, as I did, I, I stayed in the military for a total of 10 years and um, a good five years after I came mm -hmm. back from Afghanistan, helping train the, the next folks round that were going in. Um, you can also you know, decommission or separate yep. um, and get involved in nonprofit organizations and be as impactful here in Texas or for our country. Chairman, for folks at home in our audience who are watching and listening, uh, they want to keep up with you, keep up with the agency, and learn more about uh, the VLB and what the GLO is doing across our great state. Uh, how can they follow and keep up? Well, on Twitter, check out at TXGLO, where you can stay posted on the general land office activities. And then check out at Texas VLB, where you can follow the Texas Veterans Land Board and what we're doing for our vets throughout the state. Chairman, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for being such a great example of uh, continued leadership and continued service uh, after leaving the military. Here at the Next Gen Warrior Show, uh, we take great pride in talking about continued service and continued leadership across our state and across our great country. Uh, help us continue to create role models and because we know that success begets success. If we continue to share great stories like this and lessons learned, we know that veterans across the country will continue to lead and serve in a way that all of our communities need. Thank you for watching. We'll talk to you next time. Follow us on Instagram at Voices of Vets, on Twitter at Voice of Veterans, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Voices of Veterans. To hear more, please visit voicesofveterans.org. Join us in sharing the success stories of Texas veterans. Thank you for joining us for the Next Gen Warrior Podcast.